my honor to welcome Mike Ovo Lopez to our call tonight. Um, let me find my notes. Here we go. Okay. So Mike Ovo Lopez is the director of race and ethnicity uh, research at the Pew Research Center. Uh, where he leads planning and the center's research agenda focused on chronicling the diverse, ever-changing racial and ethnic landscape of the United States. He is an expert on issues of racial and ethnic uh, identity, Latino politics, culture, the U.S., Hispanic, and Asian populations, global and domestic immigration, and the U.S. demographic landscape. Um, long story short, I met Mark in my previous career <laughs> when I was a journalist and uh, it's good that I kept my contact handy and I felt that he would just be a perfect uh, person to have for today in, in honor of Hispanic heritage. So Mark, you can take it over and go right ahead. Uh, great, thank you, Karina. It was, it's uh, really great to see you and it's great to be here. Um, so when I do a presentation like this, I'm gonna have some slides that I wanna show you. Uh, but I also look forward to our conversation. So my presentation is only going to be about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, but I think it's important that we have a conversation because um, there's lots to talk about. And what I love about the music that we just saw and the videos is that it highlights, I think, one of the big stories about the nation's Hispanic population, how diverse it is. That diversity really is at the heart of a population that we have one name for, Hispanic or Latino or Latinx. But interestingly, it, uh, this is a population that has many different dimensions along the lines of origin, immigrant generation, gender, uh, so many other ways. And I think it's important to keep that in mind when we're talking about these numbers in big numbers, but it really has a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in the demographic story of this population. So I have a PowerPoint uh, show to share. Let me, let me get that going here. If I can figure out why you're not showing, uh, let me see. Um, you know, when you think you have it all set up <laughs> and you think you're ready to go and then you're not, let me try it again. Here we go. Perfect. There we are. Um, so uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Great. So I want to talk about um, some of our work. You'll see that this has a specific title, a title about Latinx, but I want to come back to Latinx because that's usually one of these questions that people have but what's the right term to use to describe the nation's Latino population? Um, but I wanna do more than just simply talk about that. I wanna talk about some of the demographic stories that we see uh, for the population. But first, a little bit about me um, and the center that I'm from. Uh, the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan, non-advocacy organization. We're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're funded almost entirely by the Pew Charitable Trust. But you should know that uh, because we're nonpartisan and non-advocacy, we don't take any positions on policy. So you might have questions for me today um, about what should be done or how do we address something. And um, I'll say, I don't know. Or <laughs> I might say, well, our survey shows uh, because we can't make any recommendations. Uh, one key element of the work that the center does is work on the uh, on science and American attitudes towards science uh, today. Uh, I put in the uh, chat a link to a report that we did on climate change activism. It was recently published in this last year, but it uh, has some very interesting findings about the ways in which Americans um, uh, see themselves getting involved in climate action. And you might find some of those findings helpful. So first, some numbers. Uh, the 2020 census data numbers were just recently released, and it showed that the census counted 62.1 million Latinos in the United States. As you can see, that number has been growing pretty fast. In fact, since 1970, the number has grown almost sixfold, um, and it's striking how quickly this number has grown. But you'll also notice that the slope of that line between 2010 and 2020 is a little flatter than it was, say, between 2000 and 2010. And that's really another one of the stories here about the demographics of this population is that while it's still growing and growing fast, it isn't growing as fast as it used to. In fact, population growth for Latinos has slowed and slowed um, significantly in the last uh, 10 years or so. There's a number of reasons for that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, one other thing that was interesting about the 2020 census findings is that the reported racial composition among U.S. Latinos has shifted. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, conversation about this. Um, why did this shift happen? But to show you what happened in 2010, 53 percent of Latinos, according to the 2010 census, said that their race was white. Uh, 37 percent said their race was something else. 
Um, about 6% indicated that they were multiracial, more than one race. Um, and what's interesting here is that in 2020, those numbers flipped. The share that said they're white dropped to 20%. The share that said they're, they're some other race uh, rose to 42. And look at that number for multiracial Latinos. It went from 6% to 33% uh, from the 2010 to 2020 census. Now you might be wondering, why did this happen? What drove some of this? And it's interesting because this was an increase of about uh, 17 million people among the Latino population indicating that they are now multiracial when they didn't do so in 2010, but they could do so. Um, the Census Bureau indicates that part of this may be due to the change in the way the census question was asked. It also may be due to the way that the data is coded now and that the Census Bureau is coding data um, in a different way than in the past, capturing more diversity in people's responses um, than had been the case before. So a lot of that multiracial number is really people who say they're white and some other race. So they're white and black, white and Asian, white and Native American or indigenous. Um, so it really is interesting that the combinations are largely white with something else in that multiracial finding. But many people have uh, uh, grabbed onto this finding and have noted that this is a really interesting result indicating that maybe the Latino population in the United States isn't as uh, white as everybody thought it was. Maybe it is browning just the way the rest of the country is browning. And perhaps that's the case. I think though, there may be a little bit of an impact of the way in which the Census Bureau asked this question. Nonetheless, the racial composition of Latinos is a very interesting story, and it only goes to show you how diverse this, back, this population is and how it sees its background is in very diverse ways. And this is only one dimension of it. Now, I, I wanna get to some of these uh, questions around pan-ethnicity and ethnic and identity labels, because this is usually the one big question I get the most of is, you know, which terms uh, should we use to describe this population? Well, first, um, where do these pan-ethnic terms come from? In the 1960s, Mexican and Puerto Rican civil rights groups were seeking some way to get better data on their populations and got together to um, advocate for the creation of a Hispanic identity question. That was actually first uh, implemented on the 1970 census. So in the 1970 census, you see the Hispanic identity question being placed on 5% of forms. So that's the first time we really have this Hispanic identity question. The term Hispanic, by the way, was adopted in the 1970s by the US government. And in the 1990s, uh, Latino emerged as an alternative um, in an OMB directive uh, to Hispanic. And so from 1997 on, the federal government was saying people are of Hispanic or Latino origin when reporting data from the census, for example. Um, and the term Latinx, which is a new term that's emerged, and I wanted to talk about this term because this is one of those terms that's uh, that in some ways has become much more used, more popular in some circles, but also a term that um, sparks a lot of reaction and debate. And so I wanna talk about that term, but it's also important to note that it's been around for a while. It first emerged in the 90s alongside Latina slash O when some, uh, some um, uh, ethnic studies uh, uh, departments and centers at universities started uh, trying to uh, reflect the diversity of experiences within the Hispanic population, but also a nod to gender by using phrases like Latina slash O or Latin with an at sign. Those were all uh, competing along with Latinx as alternatives to be more gender inclusive uh, of the population's experiences. Um, so what is Latinx? Well, Latinx is a term that um, is, uh, is a gender neutral term to refer to a person of Latin American descent. You should know that it is meant to be an alternative to the gender that Latino, Latina, and these other alternatives that emerged in the 90s. Um, it's, uh, it's meant to be a, a one that's inclusive of people who are trans, queer, agender, uh, many different uh, groups. So it's meant to be an inclusive term uh, overall um, in, a, in contrast to, to Latina or Latino. Um, and it's also a term whose use has been rising. And so we've found that in, in uh, Google searches, uh, there are more Google searches than ever for the term Latinx because the term Latinx is something that's becoming more popular uh, uh, around, uh, around the country and people are wondering about the term's meaning and so there's been more searches for it. Keep in mind that Google searches do not indicate that people uh, um, uh, use the term or find the term uh, a welcoming term, a term that they want to use. Um, it's just people are searching for the term. But interestingly, by comparison, uh, the term uh, Latinx is relatively less searched for than other terms like Hispanic, Latino, and Latina. 
And if you look at the Hispanic pattern here, you'll notice that there's a there's a spi an annual spike. That's Hispanic Heritage Month. So that gives you some sense of when Hispanic Heritage Month pops up, the word Hispanic appears in a lot of Google searches. Um, and that's a pattern we've seen actually going all the way back to the early 2000s. Um, but as you can see, Latina and Latino are more are, are searched for more often than either Hispanic or uh, a distant uh, last is, uh, is Latinx. So um, at the Pew Research Center, we wanted to find out because this term is becoming more popular, um, does the public generally know about the term? So the first question we asked is, have you ever heard of the term Latinx? Then we followed up with, if you've heard of the term, we asked people, do you actually use the term to describe yourself? And here's what we found. This is from 2019, so before the pandemic, and things may have changed. But at the time, we found that three quarters of Latino adults had never heard of the term Latinx. And of those who had heard of the term, relatively few actually use it to describe their own identity. Overall, just 3% of Latino adults use the term Latinx to describe themselves. Um, we released this finding, and this finding drew a lot of attention. Um, uh, folks uh, uh, found the finding uh, found in the finding something that uh, that they may have wanted. So lots of different people with lots of different perspectives, both pro and against Latinx, um, found something in this. But it is interesting that the people who this term is meant to describe generally are unaware of the term and uh, and haven't heard of the term. This uh, fits very well with what I have found traveling around the country. That is that many people around the country just haven't heard of the term Latinx. You ask about it. Uh, outside of Washington or outside of the big cities, and people generally just uh, have not heard of the term. They're like, what? What's that? Or I haven't heard of that term, which I think is also very interesting uh, when it comes to the use of the term. Um, you'll find that uh, those who've been most likely to have heard about this are younger people. Um, women are slightly more likely to have heard of it than, uh, than men. Uh, women are more likely to use it than men, by the way. Um, the U.S. born, uh, college graduates, and Democrats are also the ones more likely to have at least heard of the term Latinx and also perhaps use it. But across all of these groups, as you can see, uh, fewer than half have heard of the term. And among those who uh, use it, um, those shares are relatively low as well, usually under 10 percent, um, though there is one group for which the use of the term is relatively higher. So who are Latinx users? Well, two thirds are 18 to 29 years old. 70% uh, have been to college, 85% are Democrats, two thirds are in the Northeast or the West. So there's a geography to it. Uh, Latinx users are more likely than non-users to be unaffiliated with any religion. So they're not Catholic, they're not evangelical, they're oftentimes unaffiliated. Um, and 45% uh, are second generation, 22% are third or higher generation, meaning that they're not immigrants, they're the US born either children of immigrants, which is second gen, or their third or higher gen, which is their US born or US born parents. And 85% are either bilingual or English dominant. So we're, we're, we, uh, most Latinx users are not necessarily Spanish dominant uh, um, uh, people. One other interesting finding is that uh, young women are more likely than any other group that we were able to measure, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, to say that they use Latinx to describe themselves. 14% of young Hispanic women say that Latinx is a term they use to describe uh, their own identity. Now, I will say that the survey did not ask respondents about their sexual orientation, so that is a shortcoming of the survey, though we do have people in the survey sample who do uh, who say that their um, that their sexual orientation might be LGBT, uh, but uh, when you uh, when when we asked and uh, did the survey, we didn't have that question in our demographics, and that is a shortcoming of our work. So I couldn't report this for you for those who might be LGBT. So uh, that's something that we hope to be able to look at later on with another survey of Latinos in the future. Finally, um, the terms Hispanic, Latino, and Latinx. Um, should the term Latinx be used to describe the Hispanic or Latino population? And you'll find that uh, two thirds of Latinos who've heard of the term say that no, it shouldn't be used to describe the population. Only one third say it should be. That's an interesting finding because even among those who've heard of the term, uh, the majority say that it shouldn't be used as an alternative to Hispanic or Latino. Um, and when you ask about which terms people would prefer to use uh, to describe um, uh, the, the group, uh, the population, as you can see, Hispanic is by far the term preferred, even among those who've heard of Latinx. Hispanic is the term preferred by far, uh, even more so than Latino, to describe the population in the United States. Um, 
What's also interesting is we did uh, an open end uh, question to ask people about what the term uh, um, Latinx means to them. So when they hear it, what does it mean to them if they've heard the term? And you can see that 42% say, oh, it's a gender neutral term. That's, that's how I, I see it. But you can also see that there were some reactions from people in this write-in that have a number of different uh, uh, and variety of responses. Um, some folks say that it's um, something that doesn't work in Spanish. Uh, the letter uh, X is not common in Spanish. Um, others say that it's an example of, um, of US uh, quote unquote uh, colonialism or imperialism, um, that it, uh, that it, uh, it ignores a, a, a Latin America and it's really imposing a US centric view of the world on Latin Americans. Maybe, I don't know, but these are just, again, the views that people in our survey expressed about the term Latinx. Finally, um, the Latinx isn't the only term out there that's emerged to, to have a gender neutral term to describe the population. Latina is an alternative that's emerged in Latin America, and you see it emerging in Argentina, and here's a story from Argent about teens in Argentina using this term, but also it's emerged in Mexico and other places around the world as well in the, in the Spanish speaking world. And it's not alone. Uh, there are also movements in other um, parts of the world like in India to generate and create gender neutral language to describe people's identity. So more broadly speaking, the world is going through an assessment of uh, how we talk about uh, gender and how we talk about identity. Um, and I think you're going to see more movements to change language. Latinx is just one part of a broader international story. I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to talk about more in terms of the diversity of the Latino population on, an, on other dimensions. But if you want to find our work, you can find us all here. And of course, here's my contact information and my communications colleague, uh, Julia, is also somebody, if you have any questions, you can reach out to her too. Um, I will um, stop sharing my, my slideshow here. And I was gonna say that I will also send uh, uh, Karina to you the PowerPoint presentation as a PDF in case folks wanna have a copy of it. Thank you so much for that. I was actually getting that request. So I appreciate that. We can put that in our notes and share that with the rest of the team. Great. This is great. So let's open it up for questions. What kind of questions did you have? That was a great presentation, Mark. Thank you. No, thank you. Patricia. I, I do have a question. Um, so when you use his, Hispanic, could you use it because it, I assume it's for the language. Can you use it for people from Brazil too? Would you refer? You know, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Do you refer to them as a Hispanic when they don't speak? When they don't speak Spanish, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that's a really good point. It's something that many folks oftentimes ra uh, raise, like our Brazilians included in your analysis. Um, so the Census Bureau does in include people who count, who say that they're Brazilian um, in the Hispanic population if they say that they're Hispanic. But remember that the question is, are you Hispanic or Latino? So while we, we might use Hispanic to describe this population, uh, people may be thinking Latino, and we don't know for sure uh, in the way that they respond to the question. I will say in our surveys that we do, if somebody says they're Hispanic or Latino, and they enter into our public opinion surveys as such, we don't do anything other than to treat them as such. So if somebody's Brazilian and says that, then they will be counted as Hispanic or Latino. I will say we get Filipinos who participate in our surveys, indicate that they're Hispanic or Latino. We get people who are French and Italian who do as well, and Portuguese. Um, uh, so it is interesting that that Latino part is capturing, I think, people of a bunch of different backgrounds. I'd say the best thing to do if you're unsure is to ask somebody about what they want to be called if you're talking to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're describing a population, I might use the variety of Hispanic or Latino or use them interchangeably, but not try to, to split hairs and say, um, uh, so Brazilians, yes, we're counted, but only under the Latino side. And when we say Hispanic, I don't mean to include you. That seems like that's gonna be a, a can of worms to keep track of. Thanks, Olemi. Patricia, you had your hand up. Actually, I did a, a little applause thing, but <laughs> now that we're talking, now that you brought, you, you know, it's up, um, one of the things we talk about is putting out our pronouns and things like that. Um, have you heard of people using a 
for they, them in Spanish? Is that what you've heard in reference yeah. to they, them? Have you heard anything else? No, um, no. Come to think of it, no. Okay, I just wanna make sure because as we're also pursuing language justice, um, we wanna make sure that, you know, it's it's accurate on both sides. So I just wanted to declare, uh, to see if you could help me with that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a good question. Um, uh, I haven't heard anything else. I, I think this is still evolving though. Because uh, every now and then I'll see something that's that uh, is unexpected, um, but I think it's I think again it's still it's still uh, uh, people are still figuring out what the what the best way is to describe themselves. But that's really what's great about identity is people I think today are more likely to choose what they want as opposed to say, "Am I supposed to say Hispanic?" They'll say, "I am," and then they will tell you what they are. Thanks, Patricia. Natalie. I have two questions. The first was one of the slides that you shared showed that Latina was the most Googled. So I think that was the top of all the squiggly lines you showed us. Do you have any uh, rationale for why? Yeah, part of it is I think uh, it includes English and Spanish as part of the reason. And also some of those peaks were during the, the sweeps week for uh, Nuestra Belleza Latina. Okay, okay. So there's a little bit of that going on too. So there's a television show that I think people were searching for a contest. Um, nice, yeah, and Latina Magazine, it seems like that word seems to be branded or sold specifically to, to the female audience or the female audience. Yeah, and, and, it's a, and definitely, I think then again, it also just, in, just because of, uh, Latino and Latina are, you got two languages that are using it, whereas Hispanic is largely just in English. Nice. Okay, that's helpful. The second one is actually about Latin America. So Latinos, Latinos, Hispanic, you're looking through the U.S. consensus lens, uh, but in Latin America or the rest of the world, what terms are they using? So are people in Latin America identifying as Latinas? Are folks in Europe or Africa or, in, you know, we look further east, are they also calling us this? And are they identifying the Latinos on their continents in the way that we are? You know, this notion of pan-ethnic identity and using a term to describe the group is really a U.S. idea, and it's something that's emerged out of the U.S. Certainly, the term Latino, to, return, to refer to Latin Americans, is something you hear more often in Latin America, but I find that people often prefer their country of origin instead of this pan-ethnic term to describe the population. So you'll find that, for example, um, Somebody from El Salvador will prefer to say they're Salvadoreño as opposed to they're, they're Latino. Um, that's uh, that's uh, also something we see in our data that generally speaking, the panethnic terms are not preferred to describe themselves. It's really more the country of origin term that's preferred even among people who are third generation or higher. Um, but the data that I showed you was among the panethnic terms, which one do people prefer? Hispanic is just the better known one, but that's just in the US. In Europe, what do they do? Um, well, Latino or Latins refers to something totally different. It refers to people who are from countries that have uh, languages with Latin roots. Um, and uh, I don't know about anything happening in other parts of the world because there isn't as big of a presence of, of people of this heritage there. Um, but it is interesting. And I've been in Spain where people have asked me why, uh, why American Latinos don't consider Spaniards Hispanic. I actually have had the question, why don't you consider me Hispanic? Am I Hispanic? Which is kind of interesting coming from somebody in Spain, because uh, Spanish, Hispanic, Hispania, all that stuff um, kind of goes together. Uh, so I, I, again, I think that uh, it's important to note that this is largely a U.S. phenomenon. U.S. focus. I'm sorry, I'm going to tag one more on. This one's about colorism, sure. because the, the most yeah. troubling slide was that Hispanics are identifying as white. And so um, are, what other data are you using to capture this colorism, the range that exists in the Hispanic Latino community? And yeah, okay, I'll leave it there before I go any further. <laughs> and then I'll stop. Um, we have done some work in this, and, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't share the slide for that, but um, um, there's two things. First, we published something maybe about uh, a year ago or so uh, that showed that um, uh, darker skin Latinos were more likely than lighter skin Latinos to, in the year prior to that survey, to have experienced some one of, I think, six discrimination experiences that we asked about, like somebody told you to stop speaking Spanish in public, somebody told you to go back to your own country, somebody uh, non-Hispanic discriminated against you, police stopped you unfairly, uh, stuff like that. And there is a pattern. Um, how do we assess it? Well, we asked respondents in the survey, which was done online, 
to look at a series of um, different shades. Of, so there's a hand and it's got a white cuff and it's a male hand, but the hand, like you look at it like this and you then uh, have five uh, options. So it goes from lightest to darkest and people self-select for their skin color. But absolutely, there is a dimension to Latino identity that's linked in many ways to their personal experiences or life experiences, even how much um, they see opportunity in the country. There does seem to be a connection. And here, this is all tied to um, a new report that we're working on, haven't published yet, so don't have any findings I can share. But we have done a more sophisticated approach to the skin color measure. So rather than five categories, we did 10. Um, we also uh, centered a large part of the survey around the impact of skin color on people's lives. So stay tuned for that. I'm hoping to have that out before uh, uh, the end of Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you so much for sharing that. My uh, pleasure. In the chat, Tammy mentioned in Panama, Latino refers to those who are not indígena. I'm sure that is a <laughs> A, a totally different question. I, I hear a lot from the folks in Latin America about kind of reclaiming that uh, indigenous identity. So I, I'm from Ecuador, so I'm now hearing Afro-Ecuadorian, you know, it's like, it's very interesting to finally hear that. And it's so great that people are embracing it. Um, when is in the chat uh, said, hello, has an increase in Latino population translated to more representation in U.S. government over the years, whether that's local, state, federal level. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, first, about uh, about indigenous identity, we have asked in surveys about indigenous identity in a different way. The Census Bureau has a, what I call a standard race question, which asks you: Are you white, black, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaska Native, um, or some other race? That's fine and that works in a way. It's great to have that standard and it's something that's been kind of the same across the years and you can mark more than one box. And the numbers I showed you were generally, were from that sort of a, a survey question or a census question. In our surveys though, we've asked directly, do you consider yourself indigenous? Uh, such as Mayan, Quechua, et cetera, to give examples. And when you do that, rather than that very low 2% that say they're American Indian or Native Alaskan, you instead get something uh, among adults that's on the order of more like 24%, 25%. So how you ask it can make a difference. We've also asked, are you a mestizo or mestiza, mulato or mulata? And there too, uh, you get maybe about 30% of adults saying that, yes, that is, I am that. But notice again that we asked about it directly as opposed to um, asking a race question as the way the Census Bureau does. Finally, what about Afro-Latino, which is something that um, is uh, there haven't been many there haven't been many really good uh, there haven't been many good attempts at measuring that identity. We've asked about it, and I will say that our numbers have bounced around. So our first time we did it, we got 24% of Latino adults saying they're Afro-Latino. Second time we did it, we got 9%, and we just did it again, and we got 9% again. No matter what, that is higher than the 2% that the Census Bureau reports in its uh, standard race question of people who say that, they're, that they have a black racial background in some way or another. So again, how you ask it matters a lot. And frankly, black and Afro-Latino aren't necessarily always the same thing for some folks. They can be very different uh, identities, which is why to say that, that black Hispanics are Afro-Latinos is probably making some assumptions about people's identity that may not be the, the case. So when you look at this and when you ask people about it, you try to describe it, I'd say oftentimes, again, coming back to you need to let people tell you what they are if you can, or try to be um, uh, reflective of all the possibilities and not make assumptions. And it, that's hard to do, uh, it's not easy, but it's, I think, an important task to undertake if you wanna reflect people's identities and reflect it truly. Oh, government. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Gwyneth. Uh, yes, uh, representation of Latinos at all levels of government has risen over the decades. And so back in 2000, the National Association of Latino elected officials and appointed officials counted something like 3000 Latinos in federal, state and local uh, positions, uh, both elected and appointed. Um, today, that number is more like, I wanna say 8,000. So there has been some, some increase and that makes sense. The population, 
uh, is producing more leaders just because it's bigger and people are entering adulthood. It's a very young population, so a lot of stuff is still happening and people are entering this. But you are seeing more school board members. You're seeing more people uh, running cities um, uh, who are uh, members of uh, of, uh, of uh, city, uh, you know, like city councils. Uh, you see more congressional representatives, although that number has bounced around. I think it's a little bit down from what it used to be. Um, and uh, and you see more people at the state level um, being elected to office or, or running state departments. So the numbers are going up, but maybe not as fast as uh, folks might uh, might expect, given the rapid rise of the population. But I'd say youth and lack of experience is a big part of the reason why we aren't there yet. There's a lag because um, uh, a significant share of the population is under the age of 30. In fact, half of it is under the age of 30. Other questions? Any other questions, anyone? Not only asked my question about colorism, so I'm glad that you were thinking what I wanted to say. Mark, you did mention you had some information about climate change activism. Yes, I put it in the I put it in the into the chat. So you'll yeah. see that it's a report that we recently did. There are some findings for Latinos. Um, it's something that, uh, though, I think um, uh, a blog post that we're working on that I hope to have published soon, based off of that survey, focused just on Latinos, might be helpful. But the story generally is is that. Um, uh, Latinos uh, see climate change happening, that it's a result of, uh, of the activities of, of humanity, but also that um, they are being impacted locally. Um, they're more likely to say it's something is happening locally in their environment, local environment. So you find that they're more likely to be aware of it and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, to encounter it on a daily basis. In addition, uh, many Latinos uh, tell us that they, um, you know, they talk to others about becoming active and doing something to change both the way that they live, but also to get involved and to, and to have some sort of climate uh, action done in their local communities. Um, there's a lot more findings, um, but I think that the, that report will give you a good sense of what we overall found, but there's a lot of good findings in there generally about the U.S. public's um, uh, both appetite for and uh, engagement with um, change um, and changing both their personal lives and getting involved in their local communities and politics and so forth. And there's a lot of folks here in the room <laughs> that are working on their own level of activism. Um, any other questions for Mark? Uh, oh. Go ahead, Patricia. How about the term Chicano? Mm. Yes, Chicano, what about Chicano. it? Like, why isn't that put out as an option and why like why do folks have to fill it out as an other mm. you know i don't hear the term used a lot um and it really is a specific uh oh. am i still here yeah yes, now you're, you're still here great so, so Chicano is a term that is um, uh, that isn't used quite as much as it used to be, and it really does have a particular um, it sends a particular message. It's a, somebody who's generally politically very aware, um, politically engaged, um, understands the the history and struggle of the Mexican American or Mexican origin population in the Southwest, particularly California, um, and so um, it, it, it's a, it's a term that is. I think is kind of come and gone. I wouldn't say it's totally gone because I use Chicano myself to describe my identity from time to time. Um, but I find that uh, a lot of folks outside of California generally don't know about it. Even some Latinos don't quite know about it, don't understand it. So I usually find it's easier to say Hispanic or Latino, uh, frankly. Um, but why isn't it offered as an option? Uh, it depends on where in the country you are. You might see it on some forms still, in government forms in California, like a University of uh, California form or Cal State University. I think they still have it on there as you are uh, Mexican or Chicano. I, I think it's still there, but I don't think you're going to see it in New York City. Right. And, and I, too, identify as Chicana from time to time. It's like, but it gets harder to explain. But that's why Karina was also saying, like, have a bunch of different types of activists on here and I'm one of them, I'm a community organizer. I do a lot of stuff that's all grassroots. So that's why for me, Chicana is very strong, but it's not just something easy you can find. So that's why sometimes I don't, I don't say, I just say Latina, you know what I mean? So, but I was just curious to see about 
Chicano just because, you know, I wonder if anyone was still, yeah. But I know my mom would tell me that's more of a California thing, mija. You know, like, you know, so I was like, well, we're right by Mexico. Mom, what's the difference? But I was too little to understand. But she was, she tried to tell me about farm workers and I was like, what? So. <laughs> you know, there's another uh, very interesting pattern that we've seen in our data over the years, which is around the use of Hispanic versus Latino. Um, uh, in Texas, um, Hispanic is by far the most um, used term, um, much more so than Latino. Uh, in other parts of the country, Hispanic does get used more than Latino, but Texas really stands out because uh, almost half of Hispanic adults in Texas say that they prefer Hispanic to Latino. In most other places, people say they have no preference for either term. So Texas does stand out in that way. That does not surprise me. <laughs> Texas is, uh, is, is the Texas uh, Latino, Texas Mexican American, by the way. Um, here's a story for you, by the way, speaking of Chicano. I had a good friend in grad school who was uh, 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 Peter Rodriguez who, um, uh, Mexican American, so I called him Chicano. And he quickly corrected me to say he was Mexican American. He said, you don't call anybody from Texas Chicano. And that was my first introduction to getting it wrong and making assumptions that you need to uh, ask people what they want to be called. But mm -hmm. then I met his mother and she too reminded me that she's Hispanic and that she's uh, Mexican American, not um, Chicano or Chicana. Thanks, Patty. Thanks. Okay, Tammy, go ahead. So this, in a way, seems a little bit like a detour, but it's on this subject of naming, and it has to do with the like the multiracial identification, et cetera, et cetera. And it, I just really glaring to me that that on those forms the option is white, and then I guess there's black often, but then it's then it's a whole host of ethnicities, and so. What I've been finding in my own personal use, because I, because I'm a linguist too, and I think about naming things all the time, is that rather than say white, I'm saying European American. Um, you know, if we have African American, if we have Asian American, we have European American, and I find that it doesn't engrandize Europe. It actually calls attention to the fact that we're so Eurocentric by just calling a spade a spade, and it's not totally accurate because there are Caucasians from the Caucasus mountains, like the Armenians who were not, you know, and some of the Turks and whatever, who were not European, right? But since most of North America was settled by the English and the French and the Germans, it really does sort of apply, maybe some Italians and whatever. So I was curious um, how, if, if you have, it, because it's not what you're talking about, if you have information or data on that and if people are changing the way they're referring, I mean, we know they've changed black to African-American often, but not always. And, and what that distinction is and how that might apply to people who are pale. It's a really good question. So first, something about the 2020 census that makes it unique compared to the two previous ones. Um, in 2020, it was the first time that people who might indicate that they're white or who might indicate that they're black that they could write in their ethnicities. Um, so if you remember from the 2020 census form, uh, if you, when you ask the race question, it says, are you white, such as, and then it has uh, German, Italian, Irish, et cetera, and then they're under black or African-American, it had Jamaican, Nigerian, Ethiopian, et cetera, it gave some examples, just like we do for the Asian, if you choose Asian-American, there are examples underneath that, and then if you choose Hispanic, of course, there are ethnicities, as you noted, underneath that, too. Um, It'll be interesting to see what the Census Bureau's tabulation shows of people's responses to that. Those will be the first time that we have it in the census. Um, we've had it as an ancestry question in other census uh, um, surveys, like the American Community Survey. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, I think that we're living in a moment where people have, over the last 10 years, become more aware of their identity because of DNA tests. So DNA testing, I think, helps to shape that. But also the conversation that we've had over the last 10 years around race and ethnicity um, has emphasized the uh, multitude of backgrounds that people have, if you want to think about it in at least in some kind of a neutral way. Of course, there have been a no number of negative ways in which people's backgrounds have been emphasized as in President Trump. Um, so I, 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 I'm anxious and eager to see what the Census Bureau captured in that response to the to the um, uh, to the white and uh, African American race question responses. 
Second thing I wanted to say is that you know, terms that we use change over time, including the terms we use to describe um, people who are who uh, might say that their race is black. Um, I find that actually African American is now falling out of favor, and black is actually the term that's emerging as the preferred term. Negro has totally fallen off of the map. Um, but I, I, I find that African American is slipping as a term of preference for some, and I think it's because of the recent movements that have happened in reactions to events in the country over the last 10 years. Um, uh, uh, George Floyd's killing was only one of many things that sparked uh, uh, protests and also a national conversation about race. So uh, I think that uh, if we look forward to 2030, we might see um, a different set of preferences for terms with black perhaps totally emerging as the preferred term and African-American slipping. Uh, Gallup just released some data on this recently. Yeah, Maria was going to have a question. Maria, did you have a question? Oh, um, yeah, but it was like um, a little while ago, and now I have like another question, which is <laughs> like <laughs> coming off of the current conversation. And for example, um, I never identify as white or Indian or anything on the, the race question because I am a mixed person. Uh, my grandmother is uh, native from Venezuela, like indigenous. And I know like my grandfather from my mother's side, they're Spaniard, but I feel like we Latinos, we're so mixed uh, that just identifying as one thing doesn't really make sense to me. So I really just go like as other or none or like, uh, deny answering that and then just go straight to saying Latino. Do you think that's a normal trend or have you seen if that's a normal trend among people that identify as Latinos or Hispanics or, um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a really good question. And if you remember from the data that I shared, the among the racial groups that Latinos marked on the 2020 census, the single most common group, 42%, were people who said they're some other race. Mm -hmm. So they didn't say white, they didn't say black, they didn't say Asian, they didn't say Native American, they said some other race. And they, there's an opportunity to write in what that race is. Now, we don't have the tabulation of that write-in yet. The Census Bureau will eventually publish it. Um, but if you think about that, among Latinos, the most, uh, the most selected racial group were people who said something else. Not white, not black, something else. Um, and I think that that's really interesting and it's not new. We saw this in 2010 as well. In 2010, 35% of Latinos indicated that their race was some other race. But when the Census Bureau published the findings of the open end, like what did people write in? What's interesting is in 2010, the most common write-in was Hispanic. Second most common write-in, Latino or Latin American. And the third most common was Mexican. If you think about that, that's really interesting. So people are being asked their race. They're saying, oh, well, my race is not white. It's not black. It's something else. You know, my race is Hispanic. So they're telling us that their race is Hispanic. Now, I take people at their word. And I do think that for many people, their Hispanic identity is their racial identity. And that's totally OK. But I know that there's a lot of sociologists and scientists out there and folks who just get really worked up about definitions and want these definitions to be strict and stark and clear, um, meaning that people will say, oh, but Hispanic is an ethnicity, it's not a race. And that's what the Census Bureau says, Hispanic background is not a race. Yet people keep writing in that their race is Hispanic or Latino or Mexican, which I think says a lot. It tells me that their concept of race maybe it doesn't fit with the way the U.S. government uh, thinks about it, or the way the U.S. public thinks about it, but they have their own sense of what it is, or maybe they're confused and they don't know how to answer the question because they have told us in the first question that they're Hispanic, and then in the race question, they tell us again they're Hispanic. That mm -hmm. also, as a survey researcher, tells me that maybe the questions aren't working. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what we get from the responses uh, as they're coded by the Census Bureau from the 2020 Census. And your uh, your description and the way you've described how you made your choice, it's not, uh, it's not unusual. It's actually something that we see frequently in the data that we collect and the data that the Census Bureau collects. That is that many Latinos, Latinas, indicate they are some other race. Thank you. It's a great yeah. question. It is a great question. Yeah, I mean, you just made me feel so much better because I have the hardest time filling out a census form. 
uh, and I was a census taker for the 2000s. Uh, and it was crazy trying to explain to people how to self-identify, especially those that self-describe Hispanic Latinos. And they were asking me, I'm like, but white, but I'm not white. So how do I like, how do I do that? And I'm like, well, these are the only, they, at that time they were only had like white and black and then there wasn't really a lot of options. And I don't right. remember if there was an other. So it's, um, yeah, it, it becomes an issue. <laughs> it becomes an issue and how to like, how do we properly self-identify? So I'm glad that well, you know, I'm right in. Uh, another interesting uh, factoid from the 2020 census is that uh, more people selected some other race as their race than people who selected uh, Black or African American alone. So uh, if you think about that, that some other race category, which, by the way, was available in 2000 and was designed to be a, 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 a catch-all category, not a, not, a, not a category that has more people selecting it than Asian or, or Black. It was, it was thought that very few people were going to select it, but a lot of people do. Uh, and I think it really reflects, like, uh, like Maria was saying, that it's a, it is, um, uh, I don't feel that I'm white. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to mark Black because that's not me. I am something else. And let me tell you what that is. So for some, I think that that's the case. But uh, Karina, what you just described in terms of working as a as a census taker and people expressing confusion about how to answer this. Uh, yes, I hear this a lot too. So that's why as a survey researcher, I say part of it is, I think people don't quite uh, know uh, what they should answer and they get stuck in the sense of, well, what is the right answer? Uh, which isn't necessarily, I think, reflective of how they see their identity. It's what they think the census taker wants, which is a different way of answering than really about your true identity. That's very true. Patricia, you have your hand up. I came across a page on Instagram and it had, they were called the Latin diaspora. I, I never say that right. Diaspora? Diaspora. Yeah, there you go. Can you give me a little bit on like that? Have you heard of how people are now bringing that in? I've noticed a little bit of pickup for, for diaspora. That's why I was like, Hey, let me ask this. So, yeah, it's a great it's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm wondering in this Instagram uh, um, uh, this Instagram post that you saw, the Latin diaspora were they referring to Latin America or were they referring to Europe uh, and Latin America? Because it can mean many. I, I've heard it used in many different ways. I don't know. It was just a group on Instagram, mm -hmm. so that was like what they called themselves. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't explore anymore. You know what I mean? But I was just kind of curious. Well, I think that it could be used to describe people uh, or as a group that's uh, meant to be folks who um, trace their roots to the Latin parts of Europe. So that would include Italians and French, and that would include Spanish and Portuguese and all of Latin America, but also the Philippines. Um, that could be the Latin, quote unquote, diaspora if it's tied to the language. If it's about uh, Latinos in Latin America, it refers to, and it may be, because there is also a group of folks who, as I mentioned earlier, some folks who really like to have very sharp definitions. And one of those sharp definitions is Latino means all the countries in Latin America, including Brazil. Hispanic means all the Spanish speaking countries in Latin America plus Spain, um, but not Brazil. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know if the public generally feels that way about it, but I know that there's a lot of folks to get really, really intense about these definitions. And this is one of those ones like, well, Hispanic is this and Latino is that. And in all frankness, this, the US government does have a definition for what it means to be uh, Hispanic. Um, people who are Hispanic are people who trace their roots to the Spanish speaking countries of Latin America and to Spain. That is the Hispanic population by definition from, this, from the Office of Management and Budget. But that's not necessarily always like enforced. You don't see the, the police aren't going around saying, you can't call yourself Hispanic because you aren't from any of those places. Um, which is why I always say to a good friend of mine who's an Irish, his Irish background, he loves Mexican food and he, he says Mexican culture is more interesting than Irish culture. I don't know if that's true or not, not gonna make any judgments. But I tell him in the census, did you mark it to Hispanic? Because you know, if you say you are, they're gonna count you as such. You should, if you wanna be part of it, you're welcome to be a part of it. Um, he didn't do it. But even so, my point being is that uh, it's up to you to choose if you are Hispanic or Latino in all of these things you have to indicate that you are, which means that there's some people who have an ancestry in Latin America, but don't 
identify as Hispanic or Latino. You probably know folks who will tell you that, you know, oh yeah, well, I had a grandmother that was Mexican, but I don't mm -hmm. think of myself as Hispanic. That is very possible. Tammy, you have the last question because it's 9.01 Eastern time. Oh, then that's okay. I was just elaborating on this conversation, which I find fascinating. You know, it's, um, it's I bump into it. Um, I, uh, my ancestry is Italian and Irish. Uh, I've not done the DNA tests. It's just, and, and so I, I very much lived a life and a childhood as a, as a white kid in the suburbs, but, um, but my grandparents lived in Venezuela for 30 years as expats, which is different than an immigrant, of course, right? And so, um, so they came back here, but, uh, but I have dated a Colombian whose parents were here for 30 years and then they went back because they were tired of being up here. So I think that's blurring. Um, and I have you know, personally encountered, and then I lived in Central America, I lived in Panama for four or five years. And so now after coming back from that, now I'm like, I don't know, what am I, am I Latina? Am I not Latina? Like, where does that fit in? And I've had some people here be like, you're totally like a Latina. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not. and you know, and so um, it's, it's super interesting how these lines blur. And the other thing uh, is, is how Latin America is also a territory that was invaded by the Europeans. And so it became an immigrant place, right? Um, although there's a, there's a very strong Indiana presence, of course, and so the original people. So um, that makes all these lines super blurry um, because, uh, and, and living in Panama, they dealt with this, you know, how long do you have to live there before you can call yourself a Panameño? And like, and they're so small, they'd be like, they have, they remember your whole life that you weren't born there, but um, uh, because it's only four million people. But um, but you know here we accept people right away. Like you're saying, you'll take your Irish friend in. You want to play Mexican? That's fine. Um, yeah. And and that's sort of beautiful, uh, but blurry <laughs> at the same time. What, one of the other interesting things about uh, identity in the United States is um, it turns out I don't know if you know this or not, uh, Tammy. I think you might find this interesting that. Um, um, if you look at the number of Americans who say they have Irish ancestry, um, the number of people who say that they do is just too, it, it's much bigger than would be expected given fertility rates and the number of people who came from Ireland as immigrants. So that there's a lot of people who say that they're Irish, but maybe don't have no Irish um, uh, ancestry whatsoever. It turns out there's a lot of Americans as well who will say that they're Jewish because they like Seinfeld and they like bagels. We've done surveys of this at the Pew Research Center, and there's a lot of people who say that they're Jewish. When you probe deeper, they don't have any Jewish ancestry at all, but it turns out that they like Jewish culture. They were in New York and so forth, and they just kind of said, yeah, I, I'm Jewish. Um, so it is interesting that these, that these get blurred, but it also re reflects, I think, just the mix of people that are um, in the United States. And the US isn't unique. There, there's a mix of people around the world. Different countries have different stories, and I think that's what makes it's so interesting to travel and to see all of these different combinations. But um, uh, in the US story, it is interesting that there's more people who say they have Irish heritage than is possible, given the fertility rates and size of families and everything uh, uh, in the US. That is wonderful. Uh, for those watching this recording later, I'm like, I want everyone you to actually download the chat. The chat is very interesting and I'm just gonna read this for the, the, the amount of time. Uh, Callum was mentioning, uh, he said, late comment, but a lot of the West Coast and Southwest universities have programs or certificates in Chicano Latino studies while we were having a discussion about why the terminology is not um, used as much anymore. Um, Patricia was mentioning the same, on the same topic, uh, they have Mexican American studies where she is over there in Texas. Um, Natalie was mentioning uh, just realizing that race has a double meaning, given race is also defined as a competition, which is hard to digest when I see it that way. Um, Callum mentioned that his grandfather was Puerto Rican, but he's never considered himself not white at any point, since so much of the rest of his family is white. Very interesting. And Maria was mentioning in recent times, the Venezuelan diaspora has been popular in conversations because of a very large amount of Venezuelans migrating in recent years. Um, she said, I think generalizing diaspora to all Latins, Latinos is not accurate because not all citizens of Latin American countries are migrating at the same rate. Oh, that's a very fantastic comment. 
But with that, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. You want to have the last nice word? Thing? about Venezuelans. Um, just as a, you know, if you ever go have a, have a cocktail with me, you're going to find I'm going to be throwing all these facts out at you. So here's another fact. Um, the Venezuelan origin population in the United States is the fastest growing origin group among Latinos since 2010. So it's grown, it, it's more than doubled in size in the last 10 years, followed by Guatemalans and Dominicans. Those are the other two large group, fast growing groups. Mexicans are the slowest growing. This is absolutely amazing. I love, I love your knowledge. I mean, you can spend more time just like thinking of like what other questions I can ask you. Okay, but with that being said, we want to take, we want to thank Mark for being uh, with us today. Um, thank you so much for your knowledge and expertise. And uh, you're welcome to stay. We have like 10 minutes left of just, I'm going to be sharing some things that I want just everybody to know. Uh, and all of you, you're welcome to stay for the extra 10 minutes. <laughs> or uh, you're welcome to watch the recording later. I think I'm going to head out. Uh, I need to grab myself some dinner. Um, but uh, Karina, it's a real pleasure. It's great to see you. And thank you for the opportunity. Everybody, it's a real pleasure to, to meet you all. I will be sending my PowerPoint presentation as a PDF so that you have the data. And stay tuned for some of the work that we have coming on, on colorism and so forth. I'll include in my email, Karina, the link to the blog post that we published last year showing the link between discrimination and skin color. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. All right, everybody. I got you for the next 10 minutes. If you just stay with me really quick, just reviewing some things. As you know, we continue to push for a price on carbon. The organization has been very busy for the last uh, two and a half months. So right now, uh, an action that we're asking for everybody to do is to write to President Biden. Um, so in the notes, you're going to have the link and I'll put it in the chat so that you can continue, so we can continue um, advocating for this price on carbon that we want while they're doing this budget reconciliation, um, which is a very important opportunity. As a reminder, November 14th to the 16th will be our November conference. It's going to be online again. Um, it is, um, we were hoping that maybe we could see each other in person, but it's not going to be possible just yet. Um, you know, we hope that one day soon I can see you and give you a hug and you know me, I'm a hugger. Uh, but hopefully we can do that next year. Um, what else we got going on? So Hispanic Heritage Month. We didn't have a lot of time to discuss it today, but Patty and I came up with a nice little small little calendar. <laughs> so I will be sharing that in the notes, hopefully um, in the next couple of days. Uh, we have a film screening um, coming up. We wanna play Loteria online. We wanna have a cultural evening. And what we're thinking is every Friday, starting after September 15th, which is the official opening of Hispanic Heritage Month, um, to maybe have an activity. There will probably be one Friday where we won't meet because there will probably be a presentation by the diversity fellows on that Friday evening, but we're thinking Friday at eight o'clock during this entire celebration um, that we can get together and have fun and just, you know, get to know each other and do all those wonderful things that we would do if we were in person. Um, let's see. One final thing, I guess, update on the bill that we love and support. We're up to 80 co-sponsors. They haven't really moved much, but we're still hoping uh, to get more people to support the Energy Innovation Act. And that is it. If anyone has any news that you want to share, let us know. Oh, Tammy, yes, go ahead. Sorry, do you want to say the thing you said, oh? Uh, I, if you're thinking of the video, I have the video I wanted to show everybody. <laughs> Oh, nice. No, that's not what I was thinking of. Okay, um, go ahead. We also, um, so the the right, the White House is also available in Spanish. Um, so that's at cclusa.org slash Casablanca, all one word. Um, the English one is cclusa.org slash white dash house. Um, um, and so um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is we just wrote um, up here in the Northeast, um, Iona Ludi, the Northeast Regional Coordinator, wanted to send an op-ed um, about Hurricane Ida 
Um, and so we, uh, we like she wrote it, or I think some of it, whatever. It, some people wrote it in English and then uh, I translated it and we went back and forth on it. So it was really a collaborative effort. We put Iona's name on it as the Northeast Regional Coordinator and we sent it to El Diario New York. Um, it hasn't been published yet and we're gonna probably send it to some other places, but it's just a whole fresh op-ed. And so if anybody, it, it includes a paragraph about wildfires. If anybody wants to see that or in, in an area, um, uh, that maybe was affected by Ida. Um, it has a lot of good links in it to Spanish language media articles about the hurricane and climate change and stuff. So um, just let me know. Send that out there. Maybe I can circulate it in the Southeast. You know, I think it's a great idea to with the other regional coordinators as well. Yeah, especially in Florida where a lot of New Yorkers go for the winter and they're beginning to think about going down there, like maybe some of them are already there. So uh, so there are people who are connected to both places. That'd be cool. Yeah, that would be, cool. yeah. Thank that you would be wonderful. Um, in case you have not seen it yet, it was published today. Uh, CCL National published a video um, discussing how climate change works and our wonderful Tammy uh, help us translate that video so we have it available in Spanish. So um, we did publish it this evening. So go to ccl.ee, which is our Spanish language uh, Instagram account, and go like that video. And I will try to post it on our Twitter account, CCL Español, as well as our Facebook in the next couple of days. Um, but that was it. Um, anyone else have any news to share before I? Uh, stop our meeting for tonight. I just put something in the chat while Mark was leaving. It's a conference. It's a Latinx conference um, happening now through the weekend. So if you want to check it out, they talk about pay equity. I think there's a climate change session. I mean, it's just folks out on the ground changing things if you want to participate. That is fantastic. It's called LTX Connect. Is that it? Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing, Natalie. Um, Wonderful. That is it. That is um, all we had to share. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Please uh, look for the notes and for the video of this call. Um, it will be in our forum um, in the next couple of days. Um, I forgot to take the screenshot with Mark, but that's okay. Uh, we can take a screenshot of everybody here today. So Yo tengo las fotos. I got some pictures. Okay, so let me have photos. Okay, let's let's go everybody show up your camera for a second. Let me take this photo. Oh wait. I don't know. <laughs> All right, you ready? I think Lisa's away. So let me what you got going on? I, I need light. There we go. <laughs> so let me. Te esperamos, no te vemos. There you are. Okay, ready? Here we go. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. All right, everybody. Thank you and good night. Let me turn off the, the recording Gracias. and